educated, you were already erudite when it was 1963. That time, India was still a closed economy and it would remain for the coming couple of decades too. Illiteracy was still high in 1963, but skilled, skilled labor, educated labor was not the center of discussions mm. that time. So was opening up of the economy the only reason that surged the demand for skilled, mm. educated labor? Well, you know, I basically when, when I was a child, uh, while well, everybody, at least Pandit Nehru talked about science and technology and things like that, we were all focused on, on Babu jobs. <laughs> you know, you know the, the highest ambition I had at the time, <laughs> which was never realized, I'm sorry to say, was to become IAS and join a government service. You mm -hmm. know, desk jobs, desk jobs uh, uh, were, you know, pen pushing jobs mm -hmm. were the highest paid and most respected. You know, every time somebody says, I'm an engineer, you marvelous first like, my God, what is he doing in this room? <laughs> you know, I don't want to have an engineer in my in my group. I think, you know, basically, uh, India had huge self-regard uh, mm -hmm. about its possibility, uh, great dreams, and no knowledge, oh my uh, God, no yeah. technical mm -hmm. knowledge. I mean, I remember reading when... Um, Pandit Nehru said, National Planning Commission, in the first decade, we shall increase income fivefold. Hmm. I mean, hmm. in which, which, which means the man had no idea of numbers. You know, <laughs> he just did not know how to calculate. Anyway, so, you no, know, I think you're quite right. It took us ages. A, you know, basically, you're Brahmin, you're Kshatriya, you're a Vaishya. Hmm. If you're an engineer, you're Shudra. <laughs> Okay. Anybody working with their hands, anybody working with hands, skilled and so on, doesn't okay. matter. You're a Shudra. So I think there was a status problem as well. But I think as factories were built up slowly, uh, I wouldn't say so much as late as 91. What 91 did was actually solve one major problem. Engineers no longer had to leave the country. They could mm. sit at a computer. You, you know, you know, online exports of skilled, skilled uh, work. Yeah. You know, the, the Narayan Murthy challenge uh, was the great transform of India. So India was helped by technology. India was helped by digital technology because mm -hmm. it basically makes travel unnecessary. Yeah. Uh, and also, many people travel. People began to travel abroad because 1991 reforms were there. Uh, I, of course, went before that. But is it problem? Uh, problem was that we were training all these engineers. Uh, mm -hmm. They didn't find employment suddenly. Yeah. Um, and they they didn't have to do anything concrete with iron and steel. They just had to sit at a computer and just bash away. And I think 1990s was a transformative decade of India. For sure. That was a decade when Bollywood became a truly global, first truly global industry in India is Bollywood. You know, no other industry has had, had global reach and Bollywood have global reach. Mind you, it was not recognized as an industry till 1998 when Sushma Swaraj uh, gave it industry status. So yeah. producers could borrow from banks. Uh, mm. Otherwise, there was only gangster money. Uh, oh, wow. Um, I'll tell you <laughs> all about this. <laughs> no, I think, you know, I think India, India's, and of course, everybody believed that uh, uh, imports were bad, exports were not possible. We had mm. to be closed economy, national yeah. self sufficiency all that stuff. And then, you see, we didn't know we were, we were, we were doing the wrong things. Our, when I was young, we all were sort of left wing and we believed Soviet Union was a great example and we had to follow the Soviet path, you know, mm. and, and all that. And all the intellectuals had read Russian history and America was this terrible place. Um, and of course, some of us went to America, but you know, that was not, the, no Indian intellectual ever went to Moscow to study. They all went to Cambridge right. uh, <laughs> or Oxford. But yeah. this, uh, uh, this was the mentality. And apart from anything else, the general education of the population was neglected. Primary education was completely neglected. Yeah. Primary and secondary education were very bad because it, they were 
they were a state subject, not a federal subject. Okay. And and the states were, you know, until until recently, I don't know what the situation is now, but uh, primary schools in Bihar or UP and so on mm-hmm. would have teachers who were basically party uh, party members of the ruling mm-hmm. party. And they were told they didn't have to work. They didn't have to turn up to teach. They had the salary. Now, if you join a party, you're rewarded by a school teachership. And we were told, don't do any work. You just carry on party work. Uh, you know, Jean Dress, uh, who, who's a great, uh, you must be familiar with him. Uh, uh, he's a friend and a, uh, a long, long, long time friend of mine. He once went across all of Uttar Pradesh, visiting every primary school. And mm-hmm. he found that in more than half of them, there was no teacher. Oh. Oh. I think may have improved, but, uh, you know, uh, primary education was badly neglected. Women's education was badly neglected. Uh, you know, so in a sense, uh, one thing China did, among all the bad things Mao did, he eliminated the illiteracy in China in the first decade after the revolution of 1949. Mm-hmm. He inter- eliminated illiteracy completely in China. We still haven't done it. Yeah, we, don't, we still yeah. haven't done it 70 years. You see, because basically, culturally, we, we uh, respect the knowledge of Brahmins. Yes, we do. We still do. Okay. So Brahmins mm-hmm. are monopoly for knowledge. The rest should not bother. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, you know, it, these, these, are, these, are, uh, these are things we respect, but they're things which are, which are also so we have to modernize. And uh, for me, uh, my path was very straightforward. I was, a, I was a Brahmin boy with no assets in the family. I had to acquire degrees. Degrees were assets. Yes. And luckily for me, I didn't have to do IAS, but just before that, I got a fellowship. So my education abroad was financed by uh, Henry Ford in the Ford Foundation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, that changed my, uh, my, my uh, life path. Uh, mm-hmm. And I, I retained uh, interest in India and kept on coming back and forth. But basically, I also settled abroad because uh, abroad there is meritocracy. Yeah. You know, my, my promotion depends upon my my work. Uh, yes. And I don't have to know the MP or the minister or anybody else. I just carry on. So I think, you know, we have a lot to learn still from foreigners. Yes. Uh, and we have a lot, lot to learn from Asia as well, you know, rest of Asia as well as uh, the West. Uh, but we really have to have respect for all fellow citizens. Mm-hmm. especially the younger ones yeah so when you talked about up bihar i myself hail from jharkhand which was bihar about the time i've been to jharkhand I've yeah been to i am from jharkhand so i am uh, studying in bombay yeah. but i am from jharkhand yeah. and schools are better than the times you're talking about but they have a very long way to go if you talk about public schools here in delhi or bombay so yeah they are they, they quite deplorable even today yeah, I want to make a distinction between schooling and education. Yeah, please do. You know, we are much too much concerned with passing school exams, mm-hmm. getting degrees, percentage marks, and so on. But, you know, things of the, the instrument through which we are talking, the computer releases you in a lot of ways from going to school because ultimately yeah. you can access knowledge anywhere. Yeah, and yeah. especially especially in the COVID times, lots of people have set up this, you know, online or, or free online thing or uh, courses. courses and so on. And even before that, there was possibility of this uh, uh, MOOCs or whatever they're called. So you know, so from, from uh, professors from Harvard and Stanford were giving lectures, and you could all. So I think you know we. Sh- we have to supplement our schools with our mm-hmm. our um, desktops or, uh, 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 or or smartphones, because you know you don't have to take your teacher's word for for answer. I mean, I always used to get into difficulty because I always used to try to better than what my teacher had told me. <laughs> and in Indian exams, that doesn't get you anywhere. In Indian exams, you have to give the expected answer. Yeah, you get a hundred percent. 
you do anything more than that, they cut ten marks out of you uh, immediately. You know, you no independence of thinking allowed. Uh, Be nicer. Have, <laughs> yeah, you have to do what you. You know, I mean, I, I'm I'm surprised that anybody nowadays gets you know, whatever it is. 99.7% or 100% and people who get 95 are deeply disappointed uh, mm -hmm. and you know in my times you hardly hardly ever got more than 65 70% was first class and you know it's very difficult to get to that but yeah. uh, i think because of the nature of the exams have changed and they are they are kind of you know routine routine answers and so on but i think we we have an immense potential uh, because yeah. ultimately the culture respects knowledge. Yes, culture exactly. respects knowledge immensely, and I think uh, we have to play on that. I mean, we all, all, you know, in in a diverse country like India, basically all religions uh, respect knowledge, and 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 respect uh, you know learning, and mm -hmm. and so we have we have to we have to take advantage of that. And I think the biggest. Uh, treasure any country has are its young people yeah you yeah. know and that 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 is what we have to learn to uh, learn to respect so talking about supplementing schooling like you said so yeah. there are institutes like the national institute of open schooling here in pune but there are very like Guinea Chune institutions like that here in India that are actually trying to supplement schooling per se. But sure. the current education system is not giving them enough of a push to let them thrive. Why, why, what does the system need to do to recognize these institutions or, like you said, recognize supplementing schooling? You know, I think India, India is stuck with the psychology of examinations and certificates. Mm -hmm. You know, so we ought to, like we have for the uh, admission to uh, the, the engineering schools, we have to have a national exam. Yes. A national exam in which schools and non-schools, student, anybody can take uh, an exam. Mm -hmm. uh, voluntarily, they can take the exam, they can pass, they can fail. And I think if they are examined across the board on a general knowledge kind of uh, kind of way, like yeah, they do in IAS, uh, mm -hmm. I think that would give everybody an even chance. Yeah. You know, the quality of the school you have gone to and all that, you know, they may have a separate exam for the Delhi public school, I don't care. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, after those parents pay a lot of money. Uh, ultimately, everybody of a certain age should be able to take exams. I'll give you an example. In China, they had a horrendous cultural revolution for 10 years. Mao and Berserk and everybody mm -hmm. was students were sent to the countryside as all schools and colleges were shut. When Deng Xiaoping came to power, he decided uh, that, okay, if you are 20 years old, you go to university. Doesn't matter. You know, it just doesn't matter what you have done in your, in your sort of work in a countryside. You're old enough to do a graduate degree. You know, and I, I, I met one of, one of the products of that. He's a professor of Sanskrit in, in Beijing oh, University wow. who did Sanskrit without ever leaving China. China has a very good Sanskrit tradition. And he and I sat on the uh, governing body of Nalanda University, the first governing body we had. And, and, and he described to me, he said it was so good. He said, I, I had no schooling, but I had a, I had a college education. Because people said, you know, if you're 20, you can do this. Uh, and that is in, in, in UK as well. We have a lot of what we call mature students, you know, mm -hmm. people who have not had schooling. Uh, so they come to LSE at, at the age of 30, 32. They, and we say, you know, what you have done. And we admit you. Uh, I remember once uh, interviewing somebody who had come from Jamaica, had become a bus conductor. And then he came at, and he was in his union at 32. He came to do an undergraduate degree. And uh, he was very smart. Uh, yeah. So I said, come in, you know, there, there's no problem. So I think we have to sort of release the age bar and the institutional bar and say education is freely available. Let people do what they can do in a variety of ways. And then let them choose which path they succeed. But also, in a number of ways, degrees are not actually essential to anything, in, unless you are a teacher. 
you know, there, there, are, there, there are some things like medicine and so on, where you need proof that this person actually knows what they're doing. But ultimately, it is, it is knowledge which matters. Uh, and you can acquire knowledge uh, in a variety of ways. And I'm sure in India right now, if one took a, uh, you know, kind of search, there must be lots and lots of different people doing very innovative educational uh, attempts. I'm sure. Yep. Because India is like that. You know, somebody is sitting in some village with a very fantastically uh, progressive idea. But he's carrying on. He doesn't care about being known or not. He just opens his door and people come and, uh, you know, th this, that is also, uh, so I think we ought to find, at least have an inventory of, you know, like you said, uh, open schools. What kind of experiments are going on and let people know so that we can have more, especially for women who very often from a very young age onwards in rural India are confined uh, to home. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, but but parents are now understand mobile phones. Uh, you know, everybody understands mobile phones and everybody understands television. Uh, yeah. So I think it would be possible to also release the opportunities for for women uh, yeah. to be able to educate themselves that way. But you know, again, you know, degrees are degrees, but you know, knowledge is way beyond uh, degrees. So again, about knowledge, so. Uh, there are many doors open because the government has been trying to, you know, push the supply side of education, trying to recruit more teachers. They're trying to help them with salary. They're trying to build more schools, trying to mm. subsidize education for students, giving scholarships. But so when talking about the demand for education, the only push that policy wise we have right now is the midday meal scheme that's going on, which is yeah. trying to push the students to attend school. What are, are there some hindrances that are there when you're trying to formulate demand side policies for education? Because we don't have many. I think, you know, the, the only, only barrier is imagination. Uh, you know, the money, money is not all that, uh, all that uh, an obstacle. You know, mm -hmm. I think midday meals are very good, but you have to also make sure that they're good midday meals, you know, because we have also yeah. a whole capacity of people to cheat, uh, especially in Sarkari uh, jobs. But, yeah. uh, you know, I think, I mean, for example, there was a question about uh, some children have to work. Yeah. You know, to, 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 to support the family. Now, yeah. obviously, it doesn't allow them to go to school at a time when schools meet. Yeah. So in, can we find ways of giving a child allowance? Mm. Oh. Uh, you know, child allowance for every child who goes to school or can acquire education mm -hmm. in another way, like like through open schools or something like that, mm -hmm. they get a, a small amount of allowance. You know, I mean, 50 rupees, I don't know what, how much money goes right now, but maybe whatever is in it. Is, and, it, you know, for a lot of children work because their parents need them to work. Yeah. But they're really the poorest of the poor. Yeah, and thing is, how can we? I mean, nobody likes child labor, but how can we allow child labor when child labor is needed for the family, yes. while not depriving the child of education? So we use our imagination. Mm -hmm. We have them online courses, or we give them uh, scholarships or something, mm -hmm. so that they are in. If, if they're working in a large factory, we. Ask the factory to set up some some uh, some learning uh, opportunities on you know on site, and I think we should be uh, sort of positive in helping people, proactive in helping people to learn in a variety of ways. Not insist on schools. Schools are good for everybody. But there are yeah, a variety yeah. of ways of learning, and especially I'm, I'm you know, I'm astonished in, again uh, since uh, since COVID started, my own ability mm -hmm. to talk to various people, teach you know, and it's, it's been become, become very great. And I think we now have even a greater, unless there be there be better uh, instruments invented. So I think let us let us say education is more than schooling. Yeah, and knowledge is more than education. And mm -hmm. let's, let's, uh, and of course, we haven't even talked about uh, practical skills. 
I like carpentry yeah. and, and, and tailoring and, and, and blacksmith or anything like that. Well, you see, uh, again, we have too much respect for academic subjects, but the practical yeah. subjects, skills. I know in the new education policy, they have said something about skills, but yes, you know, have. generally culture. You see, when I was, when I was uh, brought up, my family positively discouraged me from learning anything practical. Oh, you see, same you'll find some, you'll hire somebody to do it. Don't, don't, don't waste your time learning. You, you study, you read your books. And, mm -hmm. and when you, when you big, when you're grown up, you'll find somebody to do this for you. I mean, it's like a division of labor, you know, your, your time is more, <laughs> but you know, so I'm in, mean, this is where I am. I'm, I'm totally, uh, you know, incapable of doing anything very, very practical. But, uh, you see, I mean, uh, I'll just give you another example. When the demonetization took place, yeah. there was a problem of ATM machines. Yes, yes. Remember, right? Yeah. Now, uh, I'm sure nobody in the Ministry of Finance and in the entire government knew how ATM machines work. <laughs> right? Yeah. That is not a job of an IAS mm -hmm. person. There's not a job of anybody who's going to be A or MA. Mm -hmm. But in America, all young people or all Britain, all young people as they study, they mm -hmm. acquire practical skills. Yes. Because that is part of the family philosophy. You oh. know, they all do how to do this kind of thing, you know, wallpaper or, you know, uh, or, you know, carpentry sort of repairs, uh, electric repairs. Mm. We have a culture in which we absolutely are told not to learn practical things. Yeah. If you are, if you are, you know, up there. So I think we have to also encourage skills every school should have one practical course. Yes. Something simple, something, you know, it, it may be it may be carpentry uh, or something like that. You know, something, everybody should learn one practice, one way of using your hands, which is also very Gandhian. You know, the Gandhian basic education was, uh, you know, uh, but something like that, because uh, we, we just have to expand our horizons about what education is. Yes, for sure. So about vocational skills, the policy, that the policy document, the latest national education policy actually talks about training the Anganwadi workers, the Asha workers to be able to substitute teachers where there is like a supply shortage of yeah. teachers. But when you go down the hierarchy, you find out the Anganwadis are under equipped too. There is a, uh, there is like a miscalculation of labor here because there are no Anganwadi's, uh, Anganwadi workers to actually train. Hmm. What did the policy makers miss or is there some way to correct it? Like, now, you, you know, one, one of the things which happens here uh, and, and it's quite usual, no policy maker has actually gone and looked at a sample of Anganwadi's. You know, if you're going to do reforms, you should have some members of the top echelons who just like going around. Again, in the Gandhian tradition, there used to be people who just went around. In like, like I'm saying about Chaudhary, he went to regional every <laughs> school. Mm -hmm. Finding out, you know, how, you know, because he was not an official, he could find out the truth. If official was coming, everybody would be warned and they all turn up in the, in the best clothes and then go away. Uh, so I think, you know, we need many more, uh, basically, even among the young people, the, uh, the idea of looking for yourself, you know, yeah. ground level research, just observation, ground level research, finding out how the world is, how do things work and so on. And so I think, you know, uh, the fact that there are no Anganwadi workers or Anganwadi workers are not uh, qualified doesn't surprise me because everybody cuts corners because the rest of the money goes to them. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, this is, this is a straightforward racket. But I think what is interesting uh, that, you know, it may be that there are some Anganwadi workers who would be better at teaching practical things yeah. to students, yeah. you know, than, than, than the teachers. And so they, they are multi-skilled. Uh, mm -hmm. So let's take advantage of that our mental skill. Mm. You see, human potential is great. We really ought to, you know, not go by science of degrees and so on, but just to find out what can people do. Yeah. 
so on the other end of the spectrum which is a very against the gandian principle is ahimsa and some uh, like the student unions lead a lot of movements in india wherein they are just looking for rights mm-hmm. of education they're just looking for rights for students to be educated equally treated equally in the campus be it socially be it caste wise but mm-hmm. all of them fizzle out at some point all none of them have been able to bring about transformational change even though the magnitude at which they are functioning is so highly it's given coverage by the media it's talked about it's talked about by the student workers so avidly with so much agility why do they fizzle out why haven't they been able to bring about transformational change you know i mean let me put it this way i also spend my life in politics uh you know uh change is very difficult especially peaceful change that you want to bring about through agitation through propaganda through uh, demonstrations you know uh yeah. it happens but you have to be persistent with it and if you read my autobiography uh you will see that i supported the student movement in the 1960s in uh, in lsc and of course students are young you think revolution is very easy you read yeah. one book and you say, i i'm i'm going to have a communist revolution day, day after tomorrow and uh, i found that basically students had a limited horizon when they're out of college they're no longer revolutionary they they got a job to do yeah right? so their commitment yeah. their commitment is very limited mm-hmm. their expectations are very high yes. and the thing life is easy they think they're occupying a campus is occupying the country uh <laughs> now we we have to let them do everything i mean no change is always good and we'll see what it but uh pers- for example let me give you a very simple example hmm. we wanted to have in the labor party a huh. child benefit scheme yeah okay child benefit okay. scheme so that okay. it goes to the mother hmm right and mm-hmm. uh, depending on how many children they have and we had this progressive idea and there were trade unions in the party and so on the mm-hmm. trade unions were completely against this oh the trade in the, the, i i've heard this person in our meeting saying you taking money from my pocket and putting in my wife's purse i don't like that oh my. right you know i mean this is a straightforward uh <laughs> I, I this is how practical thinking is this my I, i heard him and i can he was very good trade union man he was a you know, he was sort of bus driver or something but he was head of his mm-hmm. the secretary of his union he I, says i'm not going to let you cut my uh, pocket uh, pick my pocket and stuff money into my wife's purse oh no when you think about it that way mm-hmm. but but we got it through we got it oh. through by reconciling the trade unions you know and now of course child benefit is uh, accepted mm-hmm. and you know things uh, like like when when the first widows benefit was introduced way back in 1906 it was a complete shock to people why should widows be uh, compensated you know it's their fault etc and you know it takes a lot of time but you have to persist yeah and you have to get everybody together at least the majority yeah. of people have to be with you and you have to be very conscious that the losers are not bad people yeah they have lost something you have to do something about the losers i mean for me politics is all about that how to yeah. basically make gains for most people but mm-hmm. compensate the losers so that they will come along voluntarily that's what mm-hmm. democracy is about they have to come along uh, voluntarily with you yeah. not not, uh, not enthusiastically but you know they are they are coming along with you and you have to take them all together yeah uh, you know th- this this is the politics works in a democracy obviously mm-hmm. there are revolutionary you know, young people have all sorts of ideas so why not uh, but you have to be patient with them yeah you have to be very patient with uh, young people yes sir for sure patience and i think yes persistence is persistence but you know difficult. also you have to be prepared that students may come up with ideas which nobody else had 
So okay. again, in mm -hmm. the same same way, you you know, uh, uh, the best ideas come from the young, yeah. more or less. Uh, you know. Thank you. Uh, no, it, it's it's all uh, teaching students is a great fun because I used to go in there every day, and often be surprised that my students have thought through more than I had thought through about something. I mean, it's, it's a very great fun. Mm -hmm. well, there is yes. a thing in Sanskrit. Shishyat ichit parajayam. You Shishyat. should wish for defeat by your student. Oh, oh. Beautiful. Yeah. So there's a weird trend which is being observed in India, which is literacy and unemployment are positively proportional. Positive, yeah. You know, it's it's this is this is a this is a very old story. Graduate mm -hmm. unemployment in India was a yeah. raging topic in nineteen sixties and so on. So it's still very relevant. It's 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 gone nowhere. But you know, I mean, in a sense, uh, it is not just for graduates. Indian uh, surplus labor uh, mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, including people not not fully employed. Uh, is about thirty okay. percent. I'll, I'll tell you why. You know, when when uh, when COVID struck, when when we had the close down in India, first close down, mm -hmm. lockdown, mm -hmm. the people who were walking from Delhi to Bihar, yeah, it was a very tragic scene. It was, it was yes. really very very upsetting. Uh, mm -hmm. You know that they had nowhere else to go. Now, yeah. why they were going? Because they. As soon as the daily wait stopped, yeah, there's nothing back to fall back on. Yeah. They were miles from their village, so they had to walk back to their village, where they were not necessarily welcome, but that's the only thing they had. Yeah. Uh, now, Manrega, Manrega took care of some of them and so on. Uh, India has the lowest level of labor force participation by women. Yes. So a lot of and could work. You know, I have I have just written an article in a book on COVID, uh, post COVID economics, uh, oh. Sanjay Baru edited, in which I have written about this. That uh, all through planning mm -hmm. of the last seventy years, India has failed to fully employ its labor force. Yes, graduate undergraduate skilled unskilled. The economy just hasn't grown at the adequate pace. And where it has grown, it has only absorbed uh, less labor than it is available. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, it's now it's not the time, but Asian economies have done much better and so on. And we, we, could, we could talk about that. But we have to find ways of, uh, if people have migrated, keeping them where they are, giving them some unemployment benefit or something like that. And basically trying to see whether the educated unemployed can be found things to do while waiting for jobs. Why you know, are there other intermediate schemes we can we can we can show there are a lot of lot of things about cleanliness or 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 healthcare or in helping the disabled mm -hmm. which are which are not being done. Because there's yeah. no labor, that kind of matching has to be done. I think it can only be done really properly by uh, NGOs, which get government aid. Which Again, government will not do it. Government has got money. Some NGOs have to organize, mm -hmm. and I'm sure I, I know there are huge NGO culture in India. Uh, yes. And uh, as long as you don't get money from outside, nobody minds an NGO in India. <laughs> <laughs> it's when you get money from outside that you know, both, both, uh, you know, alarm takes place. So that was the end of my doubts. Uh, we have some uh, questions from the audience who are who have joined us for the session. So this is from Divija, and she asks: Given the growing importance of using electronic pedagogy, does it lead to a digital exclusion of eager learners who lack such resources? No, you see, one great thing about electronic equipment is it's getting cheaper yes, and better. Is. You mm -hmm. know, what the only thing which gets cheaper is electronic mm -hmm. gadgets. And you know, take take your smartphone. Your your smartphone has a camera. You don't have yeah. to buy a camera. You don't have lots yeah. and lots of things you would have bought otherwise. It's just mm -hmm. in a, in a smartphone. So yeah, and yeah. I 
we, we are having the same problem right now in UK that because primary schools are shut, a lot of families need uh, desktops. And yes, but even even desktops or iPads are not that expensive. So I think yeah. over time they will get cheaper. Uh, I tell you, it 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 will be cheaper than what education used to be for in 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 my in my generation. So I think that is a that's a great advantage. And also, it releases you. There's Google, and Google frees you from all kinds of things. The whole library is yeah. in your in your Google. So, sir, in the long run. such kind of open schooling through technology could actually take over traditional schooling right and, and literacy would have to and universities oh universities yeah yeah right yeah right now are very worried universities in in the west are very worried they were charging a lot of money and all that suddenly covid happens and people yeah. can study anywhere now obviously it's good to study in a group There's a lot yeah. of social interaction, a lot of learning done by talking to each other, and so on. And you, you must not uh, uh, neglect that. But universities will have to rethink their role as to what is their value added. Yeah, you know what is precisely the value added of a teacher? Because if I can download anything on my computer from from Google or wherever it is. What does the teacher do? Uh, and I think this is this is a big challenge to education that education is being transformed. And I think COVID has sped it up this mm-hmm. revolution very very much. Uh, and so we will have to rethink the whole uh, thing of education because anybody can get educated. So unless universities rethink what their role is, no, their absolutely. margin. Yeah, their marginal utility is diminishing. Like yeah. to be, But, yeah. You know, only you know, only thing they will be giving degree giving factories. Yeah, <laughs> because they may, you know, in, in India at least, India will be last country uh, which will not require degrees. Uh, but uh, you know, <laughs> everybody else knowledge is enough, but India wants degrees, uh, and so. Uh, But you know, I think yes, absolutely. Universities across the world have to rethink as to what they are actually adding uh, mm-hmm. to the available information. Yeah. So, so the next question I have is from Avik, and he asks: So you spoke about the lack of trust between the government and the businesses that have been established, which again serves as a stumbling block for small and large bus- businesses within the country. how do you establish trust between the bodies or so, uh, so that they start working for each other in synergy yeah you see i have a, i have a thing about it. in india is very interesting political culture from rss to cpm hmm. nobody says business is a good thing yeah no political party has ever been heard to say You know these businesses make profit, but they employ people, and that's good for the country. Yes. Yeah. Right. Nobody. Yeah. Well, yeah. You know the, the RSS BJP doesn't say that, and if you say that, you say you're a Sudbutki Sarkar. How can you do this? You know. <laughs> yeah, that's I, happened. Sudbutki Sarkar was the most damaging uh, episode flung uh, flung at Narendra Modi, because what's wrong? I want everybody to be suited booted in the country. I want the prosperity. It's not alien, but you know the Gandhians didn't like it, the Congress didn't like it, the BJP and the CPM doesn't like it. So we have an anti-business culture for reasons I can't understand. Because traditionally in India that was not there. Yeah, yeah. India, you know, I mean, you know, you have a lot of respect for the Chettiars and the and the Baniyas and all that sort of stuff. But somehow, in the independence movement, or after independence, socialism became very fashionable, and all that, uh, you know. And so, I think there is a cultural problem there. And also, by and large, I'm sorry to say, business get has got known more for tax evasion and bribery. But then they have to bribe because otherwise, business doesn't get done. You know, I mean, it really is kind of a vicious circle. But culturally, I'm very surprised. You see, what happened in Asia? in yeah. korea or japan or or malaysia mm-hmm. they had the local business class yeah who, yeah who had collaborated or not collaborated with the british or whatever it is as soon as they became independent the government and the business came together how can we make this country great 
Yeah. In India, from the beginning, Nehru said, I don't like the word profit. This is in quotation. He said to J.R.D. Tata, don't talk oh. to me about profit. It's a dirty word. Oh, I see. Oh. Right? I, I, that, yeah. that is what socialism was. Socialism is basically hostility to labor, uh, to business. Yeah. And you know, very, few, very few people know that in India, everybody uh, competing for any legislature mm -hmm. in any election has to sign a uh, form saying he's a socialist, he or she is a socialist. Only socialists are allowed to compete elections. I mean, basically, it makes socialism a meaningless word because if everybody is socialist, then you know the word has no meaning. Yeah, uh, it's an isolation. This, this is this is in the constitution, and I have asked many Indians; they don't know this. It's the tenth schedule of the constitution passed by Rajiv Gandhi. Yes. Oh. <laughs> Yes, I mean, it is not really the original constitution. Uh, original <laughs> constitution doesn't talk about socialism. But, uh, and you know, and no, nobody actually minds because nobody takes, takes these things it's seriously. Mm. But, you know, I think there is this problem that we have due to some strange reason, hostility to business, implacable hostility to business from all political parties. Yeah, I mean, right now they may be crying to, to tears of crocodile because of uh, the farmers, <laughs> uh, but but you know, I mean, they have you know, they have not been good to farmers when they were in power. So anyway, uh, so it it is it is a problem. Uh, it's it's a cultural problem, and it's quite the um, the questioner is quite right to point out that we have this barrier uh, between business and 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 government. Um, what, I, yeah. what I do about it, I don't know, but uh, I will. So this next question is asked by Kushali, and she asks, with upcoming time, the difficulty level of studies keeps increasing from a very young age. The expon it's exponentially increases, and it starts from a very young age. Do you think increasing the difficulty at such a young age was a good change? Every curriculum is trying to amp up their syllabus, make it a little more loaded. Yeah, you know, I think what it is, basically, that good jobs are still scarce. Mm -hmm. And education is spreading. Yeah. People are getting ambitious. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, it's, this is, this is, it may be new to her, but this has been going on for, for, <laughs> for ages. That uh, if we had many more opportunities for work in the larger economy or mm -hmm. start your own business, things like that, the pressure would be less. But there's huge concentration on government-type jobs which require first class or top thing, or going to the best schools and so on. So the premium on being in the Top one percent or one one and a half percent is so. So how do you how do you uh, test people, making it more difficult? Add yeah. hurdles. You yeah. know, uh, you know, in a sense. Uh, sorry to say, you should have been born earlier. <laughs> <laughs> I, can't, I can't. I can't say anything else about that. But you know, every <laughs> generation has found mm -hmm. this. Yeah. Not much for con not much for consolation. Mm -hmm. But every generation finds that somehow new things get, you know, the mathematics paper gets more difficult. <laughs> and yeah. and I'm, I'm, I'm surprised when I come to India that every new, well, many newspapers carry quiz columns. Because obviously yes. quiz questions are very important in exams. And, you know, what, but was, they do. what was the seventh symphony of Beethoven, you know. Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, but you know, this, this, this is an IS style question. You have to know all these quiz questions to be able to uh, to really shine in India. So this next question I have is from Veena. How mm -hmm. does India fail to use education to transform its population into a human capital asset? Doesn't vocational education come with the privilege of resources and a homogeneous population? I don't, I, I don't quite know what the question is. And the, the second half of the question is very, very obscure to me. I think oh, okay. let, 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 let's say this. India has been underdeveloped for 72 years. Mm -hmm. you know, and it, yeah. it has developed below its capacity. Mm 
I mean, I take the view uh, that the first 40 years uh, after uh, after independence were wasted. Uh, Indian India began developing only in 1991. Mm-hmm. I mean, until and, and, and they're all all complete waste. It's a wrong theory, uh, wrong model. Follow the country which collapsed, the Soviet <laughs> Union, uh, and you know it is yeah. and also in a in a in a small cake. The mm-hmm. claimants r- rose very much, so you know, and quite rightly, the OBC claims and reservations and all that mm-hmm. kind of you know. So it's a, and in the OB, all reservations are about government jobs and about yeah. government in yeah. this one, right? And so, yeah, yeah. Uh, the only thing we set up after independence is a thriving government, mm-hmm. thriving government with well paid people, and that expenditure goes on increasing. They got to a pay commission every five years is fantastic. Yeah. Uh, now, in a world like that, uh, you know, it's difficult to uh, know how to compete. But mm-hmm. the, the main problem is that outside the government sector, we need to create many, many, many more jobs. Yeah. Uh, we need to create uh, a much larger culture of self-employment, risk-taking. Uh, yeah. Than we have, and you know, everybody should have a combination of academic and practical knowledge. Yes. Everybody should have that, you know, so that you can you you can do some. But you know, l- let me put it this way: despite all that, India has more unicorns uh, and a second largest number of unicorns compared to I think only America. I mean, there are smart kids. Like the way India has done on e-commerce. I would think, again, since 1991, the way India has shown in the digital economy. Mm-hmm. You know, Sundar Pichai is not head of whatever he's head of for nothing, you know. Yeah, yeah, of course. Right? Mm. You know, I mean, I mean we, have, we, have, we have a lot of people in the Silicon Valley are, are Indian uh, Indians. And even even uh, even in India, they, they, have, they have, you know, Baijus and... And there are a lot of, lot of, uh, I mean, let me see, again, uh, we really ought to be studying their biographies. Forget about yeah. Rana Pratap. You know, forget about Rana Pratap. He's a great man. <laughs> but, you know, what we really want to know is who are the people who have, what the risk takers who are, who are having the ideas. And basically, mm-hmm. ideas make money. Yes. Nothing else makes money. Ideas make money. Somebody has to an idea. Oh, I can do this. Uh, people would like it. And I think so, to me, okay, uh, when you are your, your age, life is very difficult. For me, looking at from the other end, I'm astonished how enterprising and innovative some of the Indian young people are uh, who have who have become billionaires before they're 35 or something, you know. Yes. I said, you know, right on, and I'm like it, because they have made possible, they made people's life better. Yes, yes. And they've been paid forever fine. You know, I'm, I, I've, 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 got, I've got no problem with that. So I think uh, we, should, we, should, we should encourage and celebrate more the culture of innovators. Uh, you know, people who actually uh, use this idea, start from nothing and, you know, I, I, you know just um, in, very often what e-commerce does is bring things together which which didn't weren't being easy to bring together uh, you know yeah. the tomatoes or, tomatoes or things like that you know uh, yeah. you, you bring things together there, yeah. there is a, there's a scheme in in uh, Indonesia I don't know whether there's one one in India which couples up uh, people uh, uh, passengers with scooters oh oh, oh it's there in or, India mm-hmm. or or uh, motorcycles you know you you, yeah. you kind of and you know, it's, it's such a such a simple idea which is possible because of digital technology. Yes, yes, for sure, sir. So and so, next you know, it's question. A, uh, sorry. So, <laughs> next question. Next question. Yeah. So this uh, next question I have is from Abhijit, and he asks: India is facing a large brain drain of graduates. So when we talked about Sundar Pichai, also, it is essentially brain drain, right? Economically. It's brain drain. And unless this drain is plugged, the government does not have incentive to improve higher education. But this drain cannot be plugged without improving higher education. What should the government do? 
Yeah, I don't believe in brain drain. I'm okay. I'm I've drained. I've drained away. <laughs> I may I may or may not have a brain, but I drained away. Uh, so, you know, I mean, there are there is there's no shortage of brains in India. Okay. In uh, there, there there is no shortage of brains in India, and I think uh, we should not worry about that. And I don't think government of India is capable of doing anything anyway. Has not been for last eighty years. So uh, I'm you know I don't put much faith in governments. But I think what what it is is that uh, you know people should seek the best for themselves. Yes. Without doing any harm to other people, they should mm -hmm. seek the best for themselves. And for me, if Sundar Pichai is where he is, I feel proud. Yeah. And I think it gives a lot of younger people uh, the idea, I can do that. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. Know, it, it opens up possibilities. You know, I remember when, uh, you know, uh, 30 years ago when globalization started. People used to say, oh, you know, globalize is no good because these Americans will only have American managers. They'll never have. It's not like that at all. In America, they're willing to hire anybody who's a manager, regardless of where he comes from. Uh -huh. in, right. You know, so, so if you are able, suddenly India is not the only field where you have to, where you can succeed. You can succeed anywhere in the world. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I'm, I, I really am I'm very proud whenever I see the, the names of these people, uh, you know, running Pepsi-Cola or, uh, you know, some, some um, other multinationals. I can find good, well done. Yes, so that's, a, that's actually a better way of seeing brain drain. That's actually making me more optimistic. And yeah, when I see people succeed, like my generation, my generation, the, the elder generation, I want to take risk and I feel more motivated. I think it's easier. I think it becomes better. No, you're, you're, you're in a great generation because in every day, your possibilities are global. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was worried. I was worried when I was there, we knew a little bit about England and maybe America, but we <laughs> never thought in, in kind of familiar terms. You know, our relations didn't live there. You know, everybody has somebody living in, in America or, or UK we don't know about and you know so the the possibilities are much much bigger for you. Yeah. India is not your only only a field to play. The yes. world is a field to play. That you're the lucky generation. Yes sir. I, I believe so. It gives me a lot of hope sir. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I had tried to convey in my autobiography that if I can do it, anybody can do it. <laughs> I come from a sort of middle, middle class uh, family. And there is no reason why I should have been able to do it, but I did it because I worked hard. Yeah. What did I do in my life? Read and write. I haven't done anything mm -hmm. else. But, and so I think it is not, it is not uh, impossible. It is difficult, but it's not impossible. Yes. To get anywhere where you want to. So we are uh, working with, on a time constraint and it's Go. almost 5 p.m. here. My president, Anunita Jana, will formally end the session with a vote of thanks. Anunita, Thank whenever you. you're ready. I enjoy that very much. Thank you, Vedika. I would like to extend my heartiest gratitude to Mr. Meghna Desai for this insightful session. It was indeed a great honor to have you host this session with us today. Given the importance of not just education, but also the quality of it, your comments are indeed timely in the midst of such a relatable topic. Thank you to our enthusiastic audience for joining us today in this session. We hope to see you on day three, that is tomorrow at 11 a.m. for our first session on displacement. Thank you so much.